can you hear us out there? Hi. Well, look, welcome tonight to tonight's uh, uh, event. We're very grateful that you could come join us here at the Baker Institute. Uh, we're going to, uh, the format's going to be as follows, which is there'll be relatively brief presentations by the three of us, and then we'll open um, up to questions from the floor. We don't see this as a, a series of lectures, but as a real dialogue um, w with you in the audience playing a very, very important part. My name is Joe Barnes. I'm the Bonner Means Baker Fellow here at the Baker Institute. Um, our other distinguished panelists, and I'll make sure I get their titles right, are Dr. Jonathan Ludwig, who's a senior lecturer in Russian here at Rice University, and uh, Richard Stoll, Dr. Richard Stoll, who's the Albert Thomas Professor of Political Science at Rice University. Uh, from what I gather from talking to students, you're looking at, I think, two of... Uh, two very beloved teachers on campus, uh, in addition to all their many intellectual uh, assets. So without ado, uh, Dr. Ludwig. Okay. Um, in my limited time, I wanted to try to explain Putin a little bit, not by any means to defend him, but sort of explain some of the historical, um, con maybe content or context behind what he's doing. First of all, from the Russian point of view, Ukraine is not just another country. They can't write it off like they can the Central Asian Republics as being completely other. They can't write it off like they can the Caucasus as being sort of ungovernable, strange, other, Islamic, whatever. And it's not the Baltics, which they only had for about 40, 50 years anyway. This is really the heart of Russian civilization, right? This is where Russian civilization got its start in the city of Kiev, in the part of Russia called Kievan Rus. Um, which was founded not by the Russians, incidentally, but by the Vikings in combination with the Byzantine Empire, where they built up a nascent Russian empire that then over time moved up to Moscow under pressure from the Mongols. I just did like a thousand years of Russian history in 30 seconds there. <laughs> um, it's also the heart of Russian Christianity, and this is a very big issue considering some of um, President Putin's statements in the last couple of years, some of the anti-gay legislation that was pushed through Russia as well. Russia sees itself as the inheritor of Catholicism, as the inheritor of Eastern Orthodoxy from, um, again, the Byzantine Empire. It's now housed in Moscow, but it was brought to Russia in Kiev. So because of this, the Russians see Kiev and Ukraine as being sacred space as far as modern Russia is concerned. So they can't simply write off or ignore Ukraine like they could other countries. This, they feel, they feel like it still belongs to them for that reason. Okay? So that's one reason they're deeply involved in Ukraine. The reason they're deeply involved in Crimea have seized it, have taken it back, and are trying to reformulate this Novorossiya, this new Russia, is really issues of national security. So that's sort of our second point I want to make here. Russia's greatest defense has always been its large land mass, right? A very long distance you have to travel, just ask the Mongols, to get to the heart of Russia to take over the nation. Russia is now as small as it's been in two, three hundred years. They lost the Eastern European buffer. They lost the Soviet empire. They're down even smaller than they were in the heyday of the Russian empire in the 1800s. They're much smaller than they were. And unlike, say, the US, they're surrounded by fairly hostile nations, nations that were either part of them so they know how the Russians treated them, or nations that were brought into their orbit and never really wanted to. Okay, ideally, they would like to have nations surrounding them that are weak and compliant. Instead, they have nations that now belong to NATO, that now belong to the EU, that want in NATO, that want in the EU, or that are playing sort of skittish games with Putin's idea of a Eurasian Union. And he's had some interesting responses to Kazakhstan about that. Um, the third quick point I will make is some of this is also a reaction to the protests in Russia in 2011 and 2012. After the last set of elections, um, people took to the streets. There were civil protests in response to these elections. Not everyone thought they were free and fair, including, let's be honest, most of the world. Um, and this comes sort of hand in hand with the color revolutions, the Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003, the original Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004. 
um, the pink or yellow revolution in Kyrgyzstan in 2005 and again in 2010. And now we have again in 2013, 2014 with the actions on Maidan, another sort of orange revolution in Ukraine. So Putin sees these civil protests, the civil society having the potential to overthrow governments. Now, if something happens, say in Kyrgyzstan, you know, that's far away, right? Georgia actually surprisingly had a fairly peaceful turnover of power. But if Ukraine has this stable government, this stable system, what's Russia's excuse anymore? So it's in Putin's interest to keep Russia, uh, sorry, to keep Ukraine somewhat unstable. And I think you're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, why specifically Crimea? And this will be my last point. Why specifically Crimea? Crimea hosts the, Black, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Without the Black Sea Fleet, they have northern um, ports and ports out around Vladivostok. They have nothing down south anymore. And Putin has gone on record as saying the last thing he wants to do is encounter NATO, NATO soldiers sitting in Sevastopol where the Black Sea Fleet is contained. So he seized Crimea to secure his Black Sea Fleet to mess up NATO, as I think Joe will talk about, um, and really just to keep Ukraine unstable because that works in his best interests. Okay? And during Q&A, if you want, we can talk about some of the problems Putin's going to face in the short term and long term because of that. But I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I, I'm going to address, take up uh, and address a, a, a narrow, rather narrow uh, topic, uh, which Jonathan has mentioned, which is NATO expansion, uh, and specifically NATO expansion since the end of the Cold War. Uh, the first uh, uh, moment, most, and mo most uh, historically important part of that expansion was the inclusion of what's now East Germany in the Federal Republic of Germany and, the, and, a, full, and a full member of NATO. That was a result of a, of a series of negotiations. Uh, in 1999, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO. 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Please forgive me if I miss a country. In 2009, Albania and Croatia joined. Why did NATO expand? It's not an obvious, there's not an obvious um, answer because, of course, NATO had been uh, devised for the specific purpose of countering the threat posed by the Soviet Union. Um, uh, let me throw out some, some reasons. Um, there was uh, still the possible uh, uh, threat from Russia. In most instances, it's fairly remote, uh, but in some cases, not so remote. And uh, uh, those, these are the so-called frontline states in NATO that either border or are close to Russia. Um, I think the most vulnerable, everybody would agree, would be the, Bal would be the Baltics. Uh, uh, NATO, in, uh, the heart of NATO is Article 5, which basically makes the, uh, the, the all members in NATO uh, treat an attack on one member like a, an attack on, attack on all members. Uh, I think Rick can, can confirm this. I believe the only time Article 5 has been invoked was after 9-11 uh, in the history of the alliance. Uh, in addition, why did NATO expand? It was an effort, along with the, with the European Union, to institutionalize political and economic reforms in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, there's also just the matter of institutional inertia. This is an organ a huge. This is an organization that has a long history. Uh, in institutions simply don't like to to die. There's a certain amount of institutional inertia, and uh, and uh, of course, joining NATO was wildly popular in most of the countries that joined NATO. Now, to be honest, uh, most of the states, with the possible exception of Poland, added little to NATO strength. <clears throat> But NATO has had a significant history of, of, of member states that, that don't really contribute a great deal to the alliance. Uh, Denmark, Portugal, for instance, um, are not exactly military titans. Um, the Baltics today are, have very, very small militaries, for instance. It, I doubt they'd last a day and a half against any significant Russian incursion. Uh, in 2008, Ukraine and Georgia applied for membership action plans, which is sort of the a major step in, in becoming a, uh, a member of NATO. Uh, the EU wasn't enthusiastic about it at the time. Uh, in 2010, un, uh, under a sort of pro-Russian government, Ukraine withdrew the application. Uh, the new government is soft-peddling NATO membership in the near future, and so are most NATO members, although I noticed that the prime minister has again raised the issue about a couple weeks ago. Uh, uh, Russia has opposed NATO expansion from the beginning. Uh, 
This is not new. This began under Yeltsin. There's a big question of whether or not President H George H.W. Bush, Bush told Gorby that NATO would not expand or not. Uh, it's a controversy. It's ambiguous. Um, uh, certainly nothing was put in writing. Uh, it's to be noted that although NATO expansion was supported in general uh, by American foreign policy elites, there were certain foreign policy luminaries, including George Kennan and Henry Kissinger, who raised concerns about expansion. Uh, saying that it would lay the groundwork for conflict between the rest, between the between the West and Russia, uh, would Ukraine joining NATO earlier have stopped the current crisis? Maybe, but it might well have simply pushed uh, simply pushed forward uh, a Russian response to an earlier date. Uh, a frozen conflict, that is to say, let's say that the that the current uh, demarcation line between rebel-held territories and territories held by the Ukrainian government, let's say they were to stay in place, rather like. Uh, uh, the frozen conflict in Georgia with South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, uh, this would make it very, the existence of the, this frozen conflict would make it very difficult on its face for Ukraine to join NATO. Uh, NATO is, uh, doesn't, is, the members there are, are understandably wary about entering into agreements with countries that have outstanding territorial disputes with other countries. Uh, and there's also, I'm sure, fear in NATO capitals that if you were to offer NATO membership to, to Ukraine, there might be a point down the line where the Ukrainian government, for its own reasons, would attempt to prompt a crisis with Russia in the expectation that NATO countries would come to their aid. Rick? Uh, thank you. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what, uh, very briefly, what some of the literature in political science and international relations says it, about some of the aspects of the situation. I want to talk a little, very briefly about sanctions and when they can be successful. I want to talk about, uh, sorry, Joe, this political realism and why that you can perhaps interpret Putin from that point of view, but some other research that suggests that that's not a good way to do things. And then finally, a little bit about what we know from the study of civil wars about what, why wars last a long time and why it can be so tough to end them. Okay, so first let me briefly talk about sanctions. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, say, all sanctions that were imposed or threatened to be imposed between 1945 and 2005, the threatener or the sanctioner gets what it wants about 40% of the time. And so they're reasonably successful. However, the pattern by way this works is, is as follows. You know, country R, call them, will be anonymous. <laughs> a randomly selected a randomly one, if there was ever one. <laughs> does something that country U doesn't like. Country U threatens, has to make a decision, should I threaten sanctions or not? Country U decides to threaten sanctions. Now, country R decides to back down or not. And so if R backs down, then we would say that's a victory for sanctions. We never even had to impose them. Great. If they don't back down, then, you know, uh, you, the U has to decide, do I really impose them or not? And if they impose them, you know, how does R react? So we go back and forth. But here's the, 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 the thing from that little uh, to and fro. <clears throat> if you think about it, R is more likely to back down if the issue at stake is not very important to it. OK, you know, oh, I don't know, the, the, the Ukraine president insulted Mother Russia, so we're going to blow some stuff up. And the U.S. says, well, no, don't do that because we'll sanction you. Well, you're right. It's no big deal. So if faced with a threat, a country decides to proceed anyway, normally we assume it's because that country thinks this is a very important issue and worth paying the price the sanctions will impose. OK, there's no question that the sanctions, perhaps more indirectly than directly, have had a big impact on Russia. Their growth rate this year is supposed to be about zero. And a lot of people say it's not so much the sanctions themselves that have made that happen, but a whole bunch of foreign investors saying, I don't think we want to invest here. So it has imposed costs. It has also imposed costs, not so much on us, but on some of our European allies. But anyway, it's, sanctions was not a bad thing to try. It doesn't seem to have worked yet, and, and it may not work, but it was a reasonable thing to try. All right, now, if we had 184 hours, I could cover all parts of realism. <laughs> so if you can't get to sleep tonight, give me a call and I'll help you out. But brief, very briefly, um, 
if you think about domestic politics in the United States or any place else, we have a structure, we have rule of law, we have things that we are not supposed to do. So for those of you who are Rice undergraduates, if you have a disagreement with your roommate, you're not supposed to hit him, right? And if you, if you do that, then most likely the campus police are going to come and guess, you know, there are limits to what we can do. And that's in any domestic system, at least in principle. According to realism, that's fine domestically. Internationally, there are no rules. There is no authority that is higher than that of the state. So therefore, in a world full of states with no higher authority, every state has to do what it needs to do to protect and promote its interests. And that often means trying to find ways to increase its power and or reduce the power of other countries. Okay? This may involve actually getting involved in armed conflict. So for those of you who've ever read Machiavelli, it should be, yeah, yeah, that kind of sounds right. Uh, lest you think this is strictly a Western phenomenon, there was a, we actually believe it was a group of people writing under the same name, Cotillia, who wrote much, much earlier, I think about a thousand years earlier, in the Indian state system. But basically, all, you can only depend on yourself, and maybe you can grab a few allies, but international law, international restraint, it's not going to happen. You do what you need to do to improve your situation and weaken that of other countries. So from that point of view, this is what Putin is doing. It's not a, it's a different explanation. So when I say it's not about religion or history, realists believe this is the way the world has always worked and the way it always will work. So you go to a realist and you say, OK, I find your explanation compelling. What should the United States do? And the answer is the United States should get tough with Russia, threaten them, get support from other countries and say, collectively, we are more powerful than you. If you persist in this, we will hurt you. And they'll back down. Problem solved. OK, so that's, that's a very quick take on what realism would say is driving Putin and what the correct response would be. Uh, there is some systematic research that suggests that Eh, maybe not so much. The first thing, and I'm just very briefly going to mention a couple things. One, territory. If you get in a dispute, meaning two countries threaten, display, or use military force, think of it as a crisis with one another, and the, and the issue underlying that dispute is territory, the odds of that dispute escalating to the war are quite high. And that's at least one way to interpret what we have here, okay? That, that Russia wants to if not physically control, dominate at least a chunk of the territory of Ukraine, okay? Territorial issues are the ones that are most likely to end up in war. There's also some research that says essentially, okay, realists, this is what we see when we systematically look at situations. What we see is if countries behave the way you say they should behave, so that, for example, if they increase their military spending, if they add allies, if they threaten repeatedly, et cetera, if they get involved in repeated crisis, all things you say, this is what you have to do to protect yourself, that's not really what happens. What really happens is ultimately there's a war between the two sides. Okay? So there is this sort of anti realist prescription out there. Um, so if you're uh, President Obama, it's like, who do I believe? So it's, not, it's not a simple choice. Finally, let me say just a few brief words about civil wars. Um, if we divide civil wars into different categories and we look at ethnic civil wars, and I think there, I'm, I'm not sure this is 100 percent, you know, so is it, but there's sort of elements of that. Those wars tend to last for a very long time. Uh, particularly, particularly if there's an outside party supporting one or both sides, okay? The other thing, the fundamental issue about trying to resolve a civil war of any kind, however, is this. It's what's called in the political science literature, impress your friends, the commitment problem, okay? So just recently, the president of Ukraine sort of reached out to the rebels and said, uh, we, my government, is willing to grant you a certain amount of autonomy, and we're not going to uh, kind of arrest anybody who revolted unless we think they were war criminals. You know, and it's kind of, okay, that's a reasonable offer. The problem is, and, and let us assume, and I have no reason to believe otherwise, but let's just assume he's totally sincere about that. He's not being sneaky or whatever. The problem is, from the rebel point of view, is will he actually carry this out? And even if he carries it out, what about the next president? 
and the president after that? Will they revoke things? Because right now, the only reason they're sort of paying attention to us is because we're fighting. If the war stops and we give up most of our weapons, because that's what would typically happen in a peace agreement, now they're free to renege. So we have to be absolutely certain that not only is this offer genuine, but that we could see the same offer being genuine in 20, 30, 40 years. And if you believe that you've been discriminated against, and I'm not saying that's actually the case, but I think certainly a, a number of the rebels believe they have not been treated well, that's an awful lot to ask of them to give stuff up. Now, traditionally in the Civil War literature, what we find is that the way you can, the, the way that typically gets worked out so that you do get a peace settlement is you bring in other parties to kind of guarantee the peace settlement. But it's a tough choice for the rebels because they have to think not only of what's happening now, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So with that, I'll end my little song and dance okay. and we can go to questions. Now, now what I'd like to do now is open it to uh, questions from the floor. Um, I do ask that you try to keep your questions brief. And, what? And, make it a question. And, make, and, and make it a question, if at all possible. And I will be, I will be the person deciding uh, which of those many hands going up gets called on first. We'll only call on one person one time. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Do any of you see the form of a compromise that both is a win-win for both sides and also neither side loses face? Do you see that, and how would you structure that? You try first. <laughs> you could leave this up to me first, because yeah. that way, if I mess it up, I'm it's the junior this, guy I'm who I'm screwed it off. Okay. Two guys. <laughs> He's a moderator. He has to ask him, answer yeah. the questions. I mean, to some extent, th there's a ceasefire right now, and to some extent, Ukraine has already agreed to basically everything the Russians wanted before, right? The Ukrainians have signed on to the EU memorandum, but it's been put off to I believe 2016 now. Yeah, early. Um, January 1. And a lot of things can happen in a couple of years. Yeah. Eastern Ukraine is essentially going to be semi-autonomous anyway. Um, I'm not sure if there's a face-saving measure there or not. It's just probably how things are going to play out. Ukraine's probably not going to get into NATO anytime soon or the EU anytime soon. They're simply not qualified right now. Yeah. Remember, there were debates about if Scotland became independent, would Scotland even be allowed in? Um, I don't know. That was probably a lot of hedging. Do you want to do better? <laughs> no, I think that, you know, the sort of both a reasonable solution and a face-saving one is, is precisely that, where you grant some degree of autonomy. Uh, you might need to have some neutral folks, not necessarily armed folks, but in the eastern areas for a period of time. What, to, where are they going to come from? <laughs> any place other than Europe. Right. I mean, basically, this is the country. It's the countries of NATO can't do it. Mm -hmm. We can move those Fijians from the Golan Heights. Yeah. To I mean, do you find Eastern like the SEO do something useful? I'm not. I'm not okay. sure. But, and, and, I, and I don't know if you'd absolutely have to have outside forces, mm -hmm. but I think that would be something to consider. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you just and then hopefully after a few years. Things simmer down. Things simmer down. Yeah. There is enough autonomy to make most of the, yeah. the people living in East Ukraine happy, and so yeah. it disappears as an active conflict. I will note one thing about this. Uh, you know, and we all hope that there's a deal that uh, is reasonable, particularly for, for Ukraine, to give it some just a decent shot. I mean, that's what we're talking about, giving Ukraine a decent shot. Lord knows it has enough problems quite aside from the conflict with Russia. Right, uh, but we'll notice one thing we're not discussing, which is Crimea. Hmm? It's gone. It's gone, uh, and it's going to be something that's going to be a festering wound, mm -hmm. and we'll uh, and nobody in the world except uh, uh, except Russia and South Ossetia and and Abkhazia and a few other places are ever, ever going to accept the fact that that Crimea belongs to Russia, but. Uh, you know, you know far better than I. Uh, it's I mean, it's just inconceivable to me that even a fairly liberal Russian government would sur would would return to Ukraine at this point. Well, so it's, yeah. I say, remember, Crimea was simply handed over. It had been Russian territory before. It had never been part of the Ukrainian yeah. Soviet Socialist Republic until Khrushchev, on one of the anniversaries, who was himself Ukrainian, said, "Here, you can have it. Happy birthday." <laughs> Um, so it was sort of it was always an oddity anyway. It didn't 
It's just one of those accidents of history. Ukraine became independent when the Soviet Union disintegrated, and hey, <coughs> Crimea is a part of it yeah. at that time. But it hadn't been for a long period of None time. None of which is, is to say this. None of which is to say that, that the annexation was legal. Right, early or, or, or anything. Or even particularly wise. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think it's a reality that we're all going to have to accept. And um, neither was the vote afterwards. The vote was, you know, was... I'm, I'm waiting for the Chechen vote, by the way. I mean, <laughs> they may, you know, it was, it was, it was not a, the Chechen vote? Yeah, we're uh -huh. waiting for that one, too. If, you know, it's a, the vote in Crimea was at least as, as honest as a, as a vote in Chicago in the 30s. Uh, yes, Dr. Crane. <laughs> So what if uh, Ukraine, uh, it, it, you know, acknowledges the facts on the ground and, and, and says, look, we'll, we're willing to, uh, uh, you know, sign on the dotted line that you can have for Crimea if you leave us alone in, uh, in eastern Ukraine and back out? Do you think that's part of a viable solution? I can't see the I can't see the Ukraine government making a signing a piece of paper saying they're willing to give up the. I think if they did, that government would fall as quickly as. Um, I think that's simply the going to be an issue that they're just they're going to it's going to be an elephant in the room. And people will realize that even raising the subject will just kill the talks. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks very much. I think you sort of partially answered my question on the um, Crimea, which was that it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if that's the case, uh, is that something that the U.S. or the international community can sort of tolerate at its face? Um, and then, my second question was: There's been a number of analogies to the annexation of, of Crimea and, and uh, Eastern Ukraine to. Hitler and the Stadenland, and it may be off on scale and not particularly apt, but is that fair on any level? Can, is, is Putin, in, in other words, emboldened by the fact that he's marginally or more succeeded here, uh, and will that only invite further um, well, Okay, first of all, in terms, we, we all know what's happened after Sudetenland, but the, the, and we can sit, criticize Western countries for not standing up to Hitler, but in fact, he had a pretty good case that it had been, you know, there were a lot of Germans living there, and they wanted to be part of Germany, and they were being prevented from being part of Germany. Um, so a similar argument to what Putin made, but perhaps in reality even even a stronger argument. So I don't I don't really see that. I think that is accepted. I think one of the interesting things he said is someone who studies public opinion in Europe on things like defense spending uh, is. You know, you've already, there's been a problem in Europe in terms of their militaries that with the exception of France and Britain, most of the European countries have really cut back on their military, okay? And when Secretary of Defense Gates, or former Secretary of Defense, he did his sort of farewell tour, when he got to Europe, he said, he pointed a finger and said, you guys better step up because you can't always count on the U.S. to bail you out, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's going to be interesting to see if in reaction to this situation, even if it's settled before we're through with this event, do at least some European countries say, I guess we better pay more attention to defense? And do some European countries say, it no longer makes sense for us to be as dependent on Russian oil and gas as we have been? Now, neither of those things changes overnight, but you don't have to be crazy to envision a world five or six years from now, not a return to the Cold War or anything like that, but a situation where a number of European countries have basically said, we are going to take a more skeptical view of Russia, and we are going to prepare ourselves both economically and militarily for the fact that there may be something coming down the road, not a war. And, and I'm not saying that will happen, but if I were one of Putin's advisors, I would be worried that they may have sort of poked the bear a little on this, and they may provoke a response that a few yeah. years from now will actually put them uh, at a disadvantage. Yeah. Although, you know, these pledges to increase military expenditures yeah, have that's happened. Right. No, they have to act. They, they actually have to do them. I yeah. will note that one of the Baltic countries actually meets the NATO level. Estonia? But I think Estonia, uh, and Poland does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But the other two Baltic countries spend 1% or less on defense. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're that scared of Russia, or they're that fearful that the Article 5 guarantee under, under the North Atlantic Treaty uh, isn't as strong, it seems they're acting in a mighty peculiar way. Well, th then again, Putin might not have helped himself when he said a couple of weeks ago, I can be in five NATO capitals in a couple of weeks. And three of them were the Baltic. I mean, he, he's shooting himself in the foot when he says some of these things, too. It's sort of... Yeah. And the bear now, might not have been now, the best analogy. Now, but here, and, the other, and, the other, and the other irony is, 
it may not be so much, and Rick, you can speak to this, and this gets a little bit off the thing, and then we'll get to another question real quick, is uh, some of the problems associated with NATO are not so much funding levels as planning, proper planning and coordination uh, to ensure that the forces that exist are up to par, compatible, and, and are fully functional together, which is where we are not right now. Yeah. We're basically speaking of maybe the Brits, the UK, the Brits and us, and maybe the Germans and French have that capability, but very few countries outside mm -hmm. that NATO core. And, and then for the, the newer members, a lot of them still rely on Russian equipment yeah. and yeah. things like, you would think, well, that's stupid. That couldn't possibly be the case. Like, do you have the correct radio frequencies no, no, on your radio? This is a big deal. This is a command and control is yeah, a huge yeah. issue on the modern battlefield. And then and one more yeah. thing is, and so one way, okay, you start to improve the equipment and whatever, but you also got to practice together because yeah. you can't make this stuff up uh, on its own. But when you do that, you know, if you think Russia is nervous now about, uh, you know, this bigger NATO that keeps moving yeah. towards Mother Russia, what about the first joint exercise that has the that traditional NATO? Yeah, 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 that happens in Poland with all these new members. That, that's going to make them very And just concerned. here's one point of clarification in regard to the Baltics. We entered into an agreement with Russia that, that I'm not sure how formal it is, that NATO would... That, that the United States, for instance, would not permanently base troops there. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that agreement is null and void, and we should go ahead and place troops here if we want. Did the U.S. want or the NATO want? I think NATO, in fact. Or is it other? I think it's I, NATO. I think it was like the, the, the members of NATO before the expansion. Right. Uh, you know, I, I personally consider that null and void under the circumstances. I mean, remember, if we do send troops to these places, they're going for one reason and one reason only. You know, they're going there to die, right? This is a commitment exercise. They're not there to defend, immediately defend the, the small Baltic countries that are indefeasible from a conventional Russian attack. They're there to ensure that the United States goes to war should that attack occur. Is that a cruel way to put it, Rick? I, I think that's part of it. But there are, we saw the yeah. recent proposal for a NATO rapid reaction yeah, yeah. force. Yeah, and yeah. the idea is what they're effectively saying is, Okay, we will technically comply with this agreement and not have permanent stationing of our we will troops in the, in, within these countries. But we're going to create some military forces yeah. that can move quickly into these countries. Um, oh, they didn't quite say this. We're going to practice doing that a yeah. lot. Yeah. So, you, you know, no permanent bases, but we're going to develop a capability yeah. with at least some of our forces to do yeah. this very, okay. very quickly. Now, I thought somebody had a hand up over here. People gave up. No hands up over here. <laughs> There's a gentleman over here, but I'll go to you first. So in the earlier presentation, uh, you mentioned that uh, it is in the interest of Russia to keep Ukraine uh, unstable. Okay? But uh, what we get the feeling is that almost 50% of the people have got Russian leanings. And uh, even the referendums that they had on the eastern part of Ukraine as well as in uh, Crimea clearly shows that uh, they are in favor of uh, becoming part of uh, uh, Russia. Because Ukraine is, is after all, is is uh, is is, is coffers are empty. Uh, they don't have anything to offer. A fully corrupted country. You probably know the polling. Um, I'm not sure it's what you. Think. I, I I don't think I don't think all of the people in Eastern Ukraine want to be part of Russia, even though they're ethnically Russian. Um, part of that, I believe, is because, you know, if you look, we talked about the protests after Putin. You don't have free and fair elections in Russia. You don't have functioning civil society. I think they think that there's more hope for that in Ukraine. What they want is some sort of semi-autonomous status where they can be semi-independent, but you don't have that large number wanting to break away from Ukraine. Yeah. As far as the split in the country, remember, Ukraine is essentially two countries, right? It's, 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 it was created by the Soviets, right? The Soviets created borders for all of these issues. And Putin even mentioned that in response when Kazakhstan started to get a little bit nervous in response to Putin's, well, there are Russians in northern Kazakhstan, you know. And they started to say, well, you know, we made you anyway. You did a good job of forming a country. You know, Ukraine is like this too, right? Ukraine is sort of, this is being taped, I have to be careful. Um, it's sort of like half Poland, half Russia, you know, ethnically there. Um, so I mean, so there is a split in demographics, but I don't think you see a whole large number of people wanting to race and become Russian citizens. I think they'd sort of like the best of both worlds.
We had a question over. I just have a question first. on how much support does Putin have from the Russian people themselves for this exercise, and how secure is Putin in general? Well, the last number I have is he has an 89% approval rating, which you can be in awe of and be skeptical of all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there were protests just Sunday, the first protests in Moscow against these Ukrainian actions. The Kremlin says 5,000 people showed up. The non-Kremlin head counter said 26,000. A lot of these people were the same groups, the same people who were protesting in 2011, 2012, with some added um, just anti-war protesters. There doesn't seem to be any real desire to go in an all-out war in Ukraine. Putin's very uncomfortable having to explain why there are dead Russian soldiers coming back from Ukraine when there were no Russian soldiers in Ukraine in the first place, right? He's finding this very uncomfortable, which is something that happened in Afghanistan as well. Um, I don't see that he's in any danger of falling today. The opposition is in complete disarray. I mean, Hodorkovsky gallantly offered to come back from Switzerland to lead Russia in the new time of troubles. Um, Navalny is under house arrest, but these people have, you know, their own issues, their own problems. There's not, you know, if you look at what happened in Ukraine in the original Orange Revolution, right, there was the pro-Kremlin candidate, um, who was the guy who just got kicked out again, and then there was the more pro-Western one. You had a stable opposition of some sort. You had that in Georgia in 2003. You even had that to some extent in Kyrgyzstan in 2005, 2010. You don't have that in Russia. You have these little factions that are fighting each other, um, and some of them aren't even really legitimate opponents. They're sort of, the rumor is the money's being given by the Kremlin to people like the LDPR and Zhirinovsky to make Putin look sane by comparison. So I don't think you have where, even if you had a free and fair election, I'm not sure an opposition candidate could even come close to winning. Um, uh, this is not something I'm, I know a lot about, but I, th I would think that the biggest, his biggest problem down the road is the economy. OK. And, uh, you know, it's, it's heavily dependent on oil and gas. And as we know, sometimes the price goes up, sometimes the price goes down. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if you will see a bunch of Western European countries more or less permanently turning away, saying, well, we'll buy some of their gas and oil. But we, we don't want to depend on them heavily anymore because, you know, we're afraid what he might do. So. In the long run, I think if he has domestic difficulties, it's going to be because people get upset that the economy just isn't doing very well, and ultimately they blame him and the government. But that would be years from now. And but it might, is a real yeah, danger, and, I think. And, and I, I'm going to get to this gentleman in the top row in a minute, but I will note in passing something we don't tend to focus on, which is that the Russian economy is, is going at probably zero growth this year. The Ukrainian economy is imploding. Right. Uh, between, it'll, they're expecting between, what, 7.5% and 10% decline in GDP this year. Well, Russia may face 5%. That's the latest yeah, prediction, right? 5% decline if the sanctions you know, really kick in. Uh, so, you know, uh, the people that are hurting the most are the Ukrainians in this whole, you know, and be in, showing once again that there's, there is no justice in this world. <laughs> and yeah. in terms of getting... So some kind of solution to the immediate problem and having it persist, part of what has to be done is finding a way to bail out their, the Ukraine's economy. Yeah. Okay. And, it's going to, and I don't think the funds currently committed are going to be nearly sufficient. And I might add that for all of our great, great support for the Ukraine, as far as I can tell, in terms of direct assistance, we have provided assistance, we've been cooperative with the IMF. Basically, our commitment to date is what? A billion in loan guarantees? In other words, chump change. It's maybe what we spend in, I don't know, a couple months in Afghanistan. Uh, if you judge a country uh, not by its statements but by its real commitments, uh, our commitment to the Ukraine is mm, pretty dubious. Uh, man in the top row, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to throw out rather open-ended questions. One is, can you comment on the effect, the apparent effect of so-called useful idiots or criminal apologists on? what I characterize as deficient media reporting on, on Ukraine in Western media. And then also, I wanted, I wanted to ask if you could comment on the apparent relegation of an entire generation of Ukrainians who grew up as Ukrainians, purely as Ukrainians, not as part of the former Soviet Union, not, not as part of, part of the Soviet Union, who have now been relegated to insignificant status. 
and the fact that the U.S. has reneged on, on the Budapest Memorandum. We haven't reneged. We on haven't the reneged. The Russians reneged. did. The Russians did, and, and the Budapest Me Memorandum was not a binding one that required action, military action of any sort. It's not an Article Five guarantee. Article Five guarantees are very rare in the world of, of foreign policy. Yeah, but it's, it's the Russians who backed out of that by guaranteeing Ukraine, the Ukrainian borders would be secure and yeah. then when it be, yeah, there wasn't an agreement to respond to that. There's no, there's no, um, there's no mandatory, there's no requirement of a response. As far as people who identify as Ukrainians, I think this is why most of the people at Maidan were young people, right? You see this in Hong Kong today, you see this in Taiwan over the summer, right? It's the young people who identify most strongly against where these outside forces coming in. Um, most of the people in eastern Ukraine tend to be older. That's why they see themselves as Russians. And they may not see themselves as Russians so much as Soviet citizens. Yeah. And they sort of remember that day a little bit um, more fondly. Um, I take you had a specific useful idiot in mind. I mean, are you talking about Stephen Cohen? Yeah, that was going to be my question, yeah. If, are you talking about Stephen Cohen is who you're talking about? <laughs> If, if he is a useful idiot, he's the most prominent useful idiot. Fair enough. But, but there, there are others who I think fall into that category a little bit more unwittingly because as opposed to having long-term or longer-term correspondence who are based who are better trained specialists in the region, what the tendency has been in media these days is they'll drop something in and they kind of rotate them in and out and they really only glance upon the surface of, of issues and they end up regurgitating to the rest of the world a story that's not, in, that's not correctly characterized. I, I think one of the problems is I'm going to make a plug for studying Russian and my students, <laughs> thank you very much. You know, the Soviet Union falls apart. Um, you know, when I talked to people in the intelligence agencies about possibly working for them, the response was, well, we don't need Russian experts anymore, they're our friends. So I think you have an entire, we now know that's not correct. Um, <laughs> So you really have sort of a lost generation where there weren't Russian scholars, post-Soviet scholars, and now you have this big vacuum. And some of the young people are going into it now. They're still in grad school. They, they aren't established enough that the press runs to them. They go to these sort of former old you know, Soviet scholars who often, you know, when they gave their talks, were more impressed by, oh, I talked to this Soviet leader. I know that Soviet leader. That's how they got their visas. That's how they... Um, does that mean my time is up? No. <laughs> um, it means the popcorn is ready. Oh, good. And the vodka table's up back, I assume. Um, so I, I think a lot of that is you just, you know, Cohen has some good, I guess, press connections anyway that keeps him going, although I didn't know, honestly, he was alive until he showed back up again. Um, but I think you just have this sort of, you know, th this, this lack of sort of regional specialists. You know, they all went to Asia. They all went to South America. There just weren't that many Russian specialists for people to go to. So I think it's just uh, you know, an example of who's out there. And some of the people who are out there are now in government and the intelligence. They can't be the ones necessarily running out and being the, the pundits or the talking heads. And, and you actually see this kind of divide replicated, for example, in the intelligence community, right? That there's, you know, the, the Cold War is over, et cetera, et cetera. And they started, the, the, the old guard started to retire. They weren't doing much hiring. Mm -hmm. So then they started to call back some of the old mm -hmm. guard because of the, all the, you know, terrorism and mm -hmm. other things. And so now there's a, there are a bunch of people who have been around for a long time. And then there's a bunch of young people who, you know, are, it's probably not fair to say they're still learning on the job, but mm -hmm. they don't have a ton of experience. And there aren't very many mm -hmm. people in the middle uh, and it's going, I don't think there's a shortcut, whether we're talking about scholars or people in the intelligence community, of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to wait until the younger people gain the experience that they need to become mm -hmm. really, really good, and I don't know of a way to shortcut that. I think we'll take any questions from this gentleman, please. Uh, there's been considerable media attention to regions like the most prominent one I'm thinking of, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, like Transdenistria, that mm -hmm. like have ex yeah, that have expressed a desire that they might want to be go through this sort of Crimean election to go back to Russia. Is there any credibility to that that might happen, or that Putin might consider taking those actions down the road? I don't know enough about Transnistria. I don't know much about Transnistria. It's a it's a small region and an even smaller country. I say this with all due respect to Moldavians around the world. Uh, Putin seems, except with the exception of Crimea, 
uh, Putin seems to be pretty comfortable with the idea of frozen conflicts. That is to say, uh, these enclaves, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, the Donbass, is that how you call it in, in the Ukraine? Uh, where uh, there are little sort of provisional states, statelets uh, that, that, uh, that appear or that exist purely at the sufferance of, this, of Russia. Because it, it, it's sort of easy in a way. It's the easiest way out. He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have to get in the big deal of, of, uh, of formal annexation. Um, he, can, he can exert control and, and to a certain extent cause mischief. Uh, without such a commitment, and if, they, and if they become part of Russia, he's then responsible for building responsible, it up, you know, and fixing it, doing something to help it. This way, you he know, can keep an eye on it. He can cause trouble with it, but yeah. it's not his responsibility. And as far as how these people really feel, I, you know, until we have people who know what they're doing about polling, who go in and ask them, I, I'm a little skeptical in the same way that there's a presumption that everybody in East Ukraine wants to be part of Russia. And I just, as you said, that's just not true. So uh, it could be the case, but I'm not buying that an occasional news report from a media person who walked through a village and talked to two people is, um, and, and you have to remember, if you're in a totalitarian judgment. state, you know, w w walk on Tiananmen Square, ask people how popular the Chinese government is. You know, odds <laughs> are you're going to get a certain answer as opposed to maybe what they really think. You are. There's certain states where you just don't feel comfortable. You, know, you ask an American, they'll give you their opinion for, you know, how long have we been here? About an hour, right? But, you know, there's certain states where you just don't do that. You say what you think your neighbors might want to overhear what somebody else might hear. It's just yeah. it's a safer way to live. Now, I'm, I'm with these guys. Be very careful on uh, broad generalization, generalizations about popular opinion in, in countries which, in which polling is, 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 is difficult at best and in which there are institutional and perhaps cultural impediments. To, to honest expression of opinion. Is that a nice? Mm -hmm. um, all right, L there was somebody else. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, um, all, I mean, all the pundits are in the business of characterizing Putin, right? But uh, he has had significant influence in Russia, even under Medvedev, and he's obviously been there longer than any American president possibly could serve a term. Uh, and Dr. Stoll, you, you touched on this idea of commitment, and uh, Mr. Barnes, you, established that, you know, Gorbachev and, and Bush 41 had some <coughs> implicit, albeit controversial, discussion regarding the future status of, of NATO <coughs> expansion. I was just wondering if you could inform us a bit more about the historical dialogues between the U.S. and Russia regarding the role of NATO and uh, East-West <coughs> relations, and especially with the... Well, the let me get, you know... <coughs> What is, what is the quote from the Peloponnesian Wars? What is it? The, D, the Melian Dialogue? What is it? The, the strong, strong do what they... The strong do what they can, and the weak do, do what, what they, they must. must. Uh, Russia, uh, frankly, in the years immediately following uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was in no position at all to argue other than make formal complaints. We did offer... Uh, uh, Russia membership in various sort of um, ancillary NATO organizations. Uh, they were members of the Partnership for Peace. There's also, I think, a NATO-Russia uh, uh, consultative group that was developed in the early part of this century. So there was some effort to, in fact, a number of individuals in the West, uh, including Mr. Baker twice, uh, called for uh, working towards uh, getting Russia into NATO. Uh, I think that NATO simply felt that R Russian objection simply didn't matter because it wasn't powerful enough. And certainly the countries that joined, the populations by and large wanted to join too. We're not talking about the captive peoples of, of Eastern Europe being compelled to join NATO here. Rick, you've got something on this too? Um. I don't have anything in particular to add to what you said. I think okay. you got it right. Did we answer your question? It was a compound question. Yeah. Which you I, you we, said something else about Putin, too. In there. Yeah. No, I mean, I was just interested also in the impact mm -hmm. the EU has had with uh, I mean, the EU <coughs> Russian relations and, and, and possibly, I mean, the, the UN as well. I mean, do they, like, uh, what is the UN's role in 
in Ukraine, for example? I mean, well, the, the, the Ukraine, the problem with the, is that any, any significant action, and rec you, can, you guys can correct me on this, any significant action in regards to Ukraine will require a decision by the UN Security Council, at which Russia has a veto. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be a solution that both Russia and the United States, for example, thought was reasonable. Right. I don't think that's impossible, right. but it, you have to get both of them on board. Right. And it'd be nice if Ukraine would agree to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, is, this, is, this is a situation I fear where the final outcome will not meet the highest standards of justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in any in any great transcendental or moral in any moral sense, uh, you've already asked a question. Anyone else? Come on, please. <laughs> raise and raise. There we go. <laughs> my understanding, there are considerable populations of Russians um, around Kaliningrad, say, and elsewhere in the Baltic. Sorry, around where? Kaliningrad. I see. Kaliningrad actually belongs to Russia. It belongs to Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's that weird little sliver there. But around it, in say, yeah. I think it's Lithuania there. Do you think we could see anything like this, either revolutions or um, Russian kind of plausible deniability of military actions there? I don't know if you'd have a large number of ethnic Russians in Lithuania though wanting to break away from Lithuania. Um, you know, there have been language issues in the Baltics, I think have been resolved since they came into the EU. Um, but I really don't see them wanting to break away from what's you know, a functioning democratic state to go to a state that isn't. And, and they are a member of NATO, so, mm -hmm. yeah, and you might, Putin might say, well, I don't believe NATO would, you know, really try to defend them. But, you know, that is different than what happened in Georgia and Ukraine yes. when they weren't NATO members. Mm -hmm. right. and, and particularly given the past history, I could imagine when all the NATO countries meet, they say, you know, we're letting this guy get away with too much. We cannot let him encroach on one of our members. Mm -hmm. And then what happens after that? Who knows? I know. But there is, it does raise that interesting question, Rick, and I haven't forgotten the gentleman up there. You, if no one else puts their hands up, you do get called on next. Uh, which is the huge element of bluff associated with the Article 5 guarantee, right? Here's a question that I ask you. How many people here in the audience are mothers or fathers? Now look, tomorrow <laughs> Russian troops infiltrate Estonia. Okay, under the Article 5 guarantee, the United States considers that an attack upon the United States. Would you be willing to send your beautiful boys and girls to that country potentially to die to defend Estonia? I'm just pointing out, and you know there's a huge bluff element in this, which is, it, it, God hope nobody ever calls us on the bluff. Rick? Well, although, you know, what would, what you could, try is, okay, well, first of all, that country is so small that it would be overrun, as it was, you know, by Stalin like that, right? Yeah. So I don't see, unless you saw that coming and deployed a ton of troops there, I don't see any way, if the Russians said we're going to take it, to keep oh. them from taking it. Right. But then maybe you talk about an air campaign and you say, naval, well, you know, naval we're not just going to hit Russian targets here, but we're going to hit at least their supply lines and replacements coming in there. Or and hit then, their naval forces on the, on the high seas. Petersburg is not far away and neither is yeah. the military yeah. bases. And then the problem, and it was going to be the same problem if there had ever been World War III in Europe, even if it starts conventional. I've got whole lectures on this, but it's, <laughs> which I want to flick this. This isn't like, been to take his class whenever what, it comes up. What, what's a legitimate target to hit in the sense of we want to keep the war limited, and but the only way that happens is if NATO or the just say the United States hits targets and does things that the Russians agree are these are okay. This is not spreading the war, so we have to. And we're doing this in the midst of a war, so we can't sit down and say, well, let's draw a map and we'll, we'll circle the legitimate targets that we both agree on. So once you get into that situation, yeah. there's at least a chance it spirals out of control right. because one or both sides, nobody wants to play by the other side's rules. Right. And I might add, and Rick, you certainly know this better than me, but my impression is uh, to make the, situ you know, the, the situation even a bit more fraught, my impression is that tactical nuclear weapons retain a primacy in, in Russia, Russian military doctrine that they do not 
among NATO countries. Yeah. Now, I think that's fair to say, except they did like have no role in our doctrine anymore. So even right. if they only have a little bit, it's more. But yeah, once, you know, you can agree to certain limitations, but once a war starts and you start to lose, would you keep within those limitations if you were very certain you were going to lose the war? Or would you feel, I know we agreed to this, it made sense to agree to this, but we can't tolerate losing, so we're going to have to escalate. So if, they actually, if Russia actually directly invaded one of those countries, we are in an incredibly dangerous situation, much more dangerous, in my opinion, potentially, than even like the Cuban Missile Crisis yeah. and the Cold War. Yeah. All right. So any... All right. Well, you will get to I you. I got like three questions to you. Yes. I believe you, are you the first woman that has asked a question? I don't know. Am I? Okay. We're going to try to improve that. Okay, my question is, is what are the risks associated to when an outside power upsets confront Russia, like the U.S. with sanctions, what risks do they face over this confrontation with who, Ukraine? Who, who, who face what risks? The U.S., okay. from our point of view. What risks do we face by confronting Russia over the Ukraine? Um, I would say not very much. I mean, uh, Russia talked about it, and I think they've actually implemented some sanctions against the United States. But as opposed to Western Europe, we're much less dependent on them for trade or anything like that. So I think any, virtually anything they could do with us with sanctions, would it would hurt some particular Americans and some particular American companies. But collectively, we probably wouldn't even notice it. Uh, so in terms of their ability to get to us, I, I just don't see that they possess the means to do that uh, in this day and time. But I think that's part of their hope is that it hurts Western Europe, it doesn't hurt us, and that breaks apart right. that sort of sanction alliance there. That and, and, Europe it, can and, and it's occurring at a particularly uh, uh, clumsy period from Western Europe's point of view, right? Because the, the major economies there are either in or approaching recession. Um, so it's a delicate time uh, for the EU. There's a question here in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so then, when we talk about the crisis in Ukraine, we usually think about the I mean the Russian aggression, but we also know that Ukraine itself is in a crisis, given the economic situation, and also given those political politically dissonant voices. Uh, one suggesting ceasefire, another talking about building a wall along uh, along the border. Yeah. So, how would you evaluate the development, the political development within Ukraine, assuming <coughs> that the ceasefire holds and that maybe there is more autonomy? How stable is the government? How? I mean, I think the government's as stable as the Ukrainian economy is stable. I think if it starts to fall apart, the government risks falling again. Yeah. Which means if there is a, an acceptable solution to the kind of military, political part of this crisis, a whole bunch of countries have to pitch in mm -hmm. to help the Ukrainian yeah. economy. Including the United States. Mm -hmm. or, or otherwise, I think that solution falls apart yeah. as the economy mm -hmm. crashes. Yeah. Well, which is why it's in Ukraine's interest to solve this, too. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's more in Russia's interest to keep this going. It's in Ukraine's interest to find a solution. Yeah. Um, but as you, as you said, the, the um, commitment of the U.S. is fairly dubious so far. So Do you far. see that? Well, look, I, 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 I certainly hope so. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't consider myself particularly leftist in my, in my views. But I never cease to be astonished by the, the unwillingness of the United States government to pony up money to help solve foreign policy crisis and our insane rush to use military force at the first drop of a hat. Uh, if there's a way to solve foreign policy problems through money, I would choose it every single time. Uh, we have you, please. Uh, I have a question about Sunny news reports. You get a lot about a return to Cold War rhetoric. And now with sort of increasing isolation and sanctions, I was wondering how far you thought that kind of direction was useful in thinking about Ukraine at the moment and, and, and Russia generally. 
Um, well, I don't think the rhetoric has reached the levels that it was in the Cold War. Having, having unfortunately, been old enough to live through a lot of that, uh, it, this is this. It, a lot of this is small potatoes. Now, if this situation lingers on and on, and and the Russians start creeping around other places, and again, mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I even then, I would say we're back to the Cold War and the rhetoric of the Cold War, but. Uh, for now, this is relative to, to those situations in the Cold War, I think somewhat mild. Um, and, you know, we do want to have this crisis solved and move forward, but this isn't nearly as bad as some of the other situations we were faced with in the 50s and the 60s. No. Uh, I'm going to break my rule, and I will let you ask a second question. <laughs> you know why? Because you're so darned eager. <laughs> uh, along the lines of the Bolden Putin, uh, what's what what's next on his, if he has a strategic wish, wish list? What is next uh, on it, um, or what how, what does his playbook look from the Kremlin's point of view from here? Do you want to try? Um, uh, let me say a couple things, and then I'll let you. First of all, I think in terms of looking for places, I think he's an opportunist, not a planner. Okay, I think. Things kind of blew up in Ukraine and gave him the opportunity. I mean, d- d- you know, there was the, the former American ambassador to Russia, who is now back at Stanford, I think. He said, you know, when this McFall? whole thing, yeah, he said the whole thing in the Crimea came back. He said, I look back at every speech that every remark Putin had ever made, and never once did he mention Crimea. Right now, maybe deep in his heart of hearts, but I think that has more to do with I want Russia to be bigger and stronger. But I think this was an opportunity that he chose to take, and and I don't think he has this master plan. I, of course, I think that about almost all politicians. Uh, anyway, so I think he will continue to try to take advantage of situations that develop that he thinks he can get something out of, as opposed to sort of, you know, we're doing this one next, we're doing this one next, and we're marching down the road. I do think one thing he, he will be trying to do is to rebuild, to a certain extent, the, so, the Russian military. OK, and part of that involves selling arms abroad to get money to, you know, to rebuild it. It, it was in very terrible shape. And they are in the midst of they, they understand that in this day and age, in most countries, a drafty army will be a terrible army and you need to have a professional force. But you got to pay them. Right. And so they are starting part of their army is professional basically but most of it is still draftees yeah. and i think for for them to really improve their military they have to move almost totally to a kind of professional model the same kind of model we have here that's going to take years but i think he's going to try to improve it not necessarily because he wants to use it to conquer any place but it's like i need to have a strong military so when yeah. things do turn up I have a credible threat that I can use, and I can maybe scare some people into not reacting because my military is better. Yeah. So, so sort of the way that the West could scare him right when the Soviet Union fell apart. Right. You know, they're in shambles. They figured it was just easier to play along than to pick a fight, either diplomatically or militarily. I think he wants to. You remember, he said the greatest you know tragedy of the 20th century was the fall of the Soviet Union. I can think of a few others <laughs> yeah. that were a little bit bigger. Yes. Um, you know, and he spent the waning days of the Cold War burning and shredding KGB documents. What was it, Dresden? Not even a top-rate German city. Sorry, Germany. Um, <laughs> That's you know, he wasn't, he wasn't Dresden, in Berlin. You know, he wasn't in Berlin, for example. Okay. Um, so you know, so so he sees you know he sees his career, his whole plan sort of falling apart. He's never going to rebuild the Soviet Union, but I think he wants it to be respected on this world stage again. Yeah, yeah. He sees Russia as having been pushed around. Yeah. Uh, well, well, y- yes, please. Uh, so we've seen the Russian media play a large part uh, in Crimea, in the Donbass. Um, certainly, you know, but it's, it's been a rather effective arm of, of Russian foreign policy. Um, given that, uh, and given the skepticism generally of the media, um, of all media, Western, Russian, uh, in that part of the world, um, what can be done from, from the Ukrainian standpoint, from Western standpoint, uh, to counter that? Can anything be done? I, I don't necessarily buy. I mean, they've been spouting a particular line. I understand that. And I think there are some Russians that find, that, that believe that. 
it's not clear to me that they have been that effective in convincing people who felt differently about the situation. Oh, I guess I was wrong about that. I mean, I think that's what they're trying to do. But again, you show me the money on that. Uh, and I think, you know, we will continue to see, however, in countries that don't have a, you know, a truly free press, that there are elements in, in the media that will basically parrot the government line. And that's just the way it is. But how many people actually buy into it, I think, is a separate and different question. Because even the couple of independent um, Russian news entities, that Radio Echo Moscow comes to mind, I forget what the other one is, have sort of been pressured to toll more of the line, I believe, lately. Yeah. And, and don't also forget, you know, the uh, there is this dang, and it's a pretty universal phenomenon, the rally around the flag effect. You know, uh, you know when when a cr crisis, a foreign crisis, develops, you'll tend to see support for for the executive mm -hmm. uh, go up. Go up. Uh, but in a lot of instances, particularly if the conflict lingers, that level of support goes down. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't happen all the time, and usually it's not that big a boost. And what, one thing that goes along with people yeah. thinking that is, oh, Putin or, for example, Obama yeah. did this. You know created the Ukraine situation, started bombing ISIS for domestic political gain. Right. Okay. You've yeah. already, there have already been, every time the United States has used military force since, at least since the Vietnam War, there have always been some commentators who say that president, whoever it was, did it for domestic reasons. Especially once in, in the autumn right before an election. Yeah. Although the truth is, if you kind of look at the ups and downs, and in terms of Obama, if he really did this, and I seriously don't think he did, because there's really no systematic evidence that presidents do this, he did it too early. So. <laughs> okay, I think we'll probably take a couple, three more questions, and then call it quits. And anybody want to ask a couple last questions on the way out? Grab us. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, and then we're looking here for some new questions. You're in. You're you're a double dipper, sir. There's, I think there's, there's a new one over here. There's a new one over here. I won't forget you, Double Dipper. <laughs> so just in the, in the context of how, how would you rate the, the, the outcome that we've had to deal with have, if you had been like proposed the situation like a year or so ago? I mean, is this, is this pretty much what, what you would expect out of an outcome, or is this a better or worse <clears throat> outcome? That's the of you guys doing class work. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we know the outcome yet. Okay, I mean, things have cooled down. There is the prospect that you get this kind of compromise yep. deal with more autonomy for the eastern part of Ukraine. Yeah. And not that they're going to say this publicly, but the Russian troops go away, mm -hmm. right? And things become settled. What Russian troops? Yeah, that's right. I, I don't think we're there yet, though. Uh, if you ask mm -hmm. me, I think that's the most likely outcome, but we probably need to have another event in the spring about this to be sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's you know everybody knows when wars begin. It's really tough to tell when they end. It's true, Rick. Yeah, most of, a lot of the time it is. A lot yes. of the time it is. All right, uh, we have a double dipper, but he's, he asked an intelligent first question. We only <laughs> we'll cut you off if your second question doesn't seem intelligent. Okay. Uh, my question is: is is there any independence in Moscow with the rebel groups, both military and politically? And I think that after the shooting down of the commercial airline, there were a number of identified leaders in the rebel group who suddenly disappeared. They were sick, yeah, yeah. they were ill, and they left the scene. So what is going on with the leadership within that rebel group and how dependent is it? Well, you have to, I say you have to remember originally Putin sort of backed away from supporting them. I think some of them even been before that until they started to lose. Then he felt like he had to go into sort of save Russian face. So I think he was more... He probably he, he got what he wanted with Ukraine, and now he has this other problem, which are rebels that he can't control, who have weapons that are Russian-made yeah. that they're using in ways he doesn't approve of. He pro he probably for that reason wishes they would sort of go away. That would be my guess, yeah. because he can't control them. Yeah, this is by the way a problem not unique to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Rick would t Rick could probably give us twenty examples of what I would call fractious clients of oh, the United Iraq, States, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. In other words, this is, this is the problem uh, of betting on, on groups that you do not control, mm -hmm. is that you do not control them. 
Uh, and I, when, when that terrible tragedy of the Malaysian airliner got shot down, the first thing that crossed my mind was, I suppose we won't be giving anti-aircraft weapons to the Syrian opposition now. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the reality of the world we live in. Uh, another couple questions? Anything out there? Way back. Way back. Uh, following up on... on could, could you talk up a little bit, please? Sure, sure. Following up on the previous question, could, could you expand a bit on what the terms were of the Budapest Memorandum? Because speaking from the point of view of uh, other expatriates who used to live in Ukraine recently yeah. and many, many young Ukrainians, there is a very palpable sense of betrayal that the U.S. and, and the U.K. did not stand up. What, do you exp- what, what did you want? The, Un- the United States is under no commitment. Well, here, here's the here's, here's, yeah. There's a perceptual thing about this, too, because regardless of, of legal terms and, and obligations, yeah. the fact remains that you had John Major and you had Bill Clinton yeah. and you had Boris Yeltsin sign this document, which apparently, in spirit anyway, outlined these commitments. And then you read in the media that, oh, these things weren't legally binding, so... Well, they weren't legally binding. <laughs> uh, again, that, that, that doesn't dispelled perception of people on the ground. Oh, well, no, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure that I'm sure that the perception on the ground is that. But but I'm sure there's a lot of people in the Ukraine that would like to see the 82nd Airborne Division land there too, right? No. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we live in a real world, and there's a reason that the Budapest Memorandum did not did not contain these binding legal requirements. The United States wasn't prepared to make them. Rick, have any? No, that's not. I mean, I mean, the perception may be, may be correct. The perception is no doubt there. Um, and the perception is in every way understandable. But there's a reason that it wasn't made formally binding, which is because we didn't consider it of sufficient importance to bind ourselves that way. And, and there is no taste whatsoever here in the United States or Western Europe, as far as I can tell, or in, probably not even in Eastern Europe, to send combat troops to the Ukraine. In which case, is there a point in paying this lip service? And, and to, your, to your comment that, you know, what we are sending there in terms of financial aid, yeah. is dropping the bucket, is that even, why, why are we even playing the game? Well, we are doing sanctions, mm-hmm. right? Because we, and we're very forward-leaning on sanctions because they don't hurt us much. Um, it's, uh, I would, what would you, possibly we gave money because the Ukrainian, was it Poroshenko who came to DC? Yeah. Came and you don't want to send him back empty-handed. You know, um, I'm sure the United States government is would love to see Russia leave, right? It, its troops removed. Would love to see a peaceful resolution, maybe grant some you know extra autonomy in the east, but give Ukraine a a decent shot, right, at a democratic and and uh, 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 prosperous future. But the question always is, what is the United States prepared to pay in treasure or lives? to achieve that outcome. And the story's not over yet. Right? And, and that's when the point's so, well taken. It, it still know, could, mm-hmm. this still could, well, go on. It, it, so if there is, if the, the level of conflict basically disappears, there is a, somewhat more autonomy in the East and everybody's pretty happy, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that life is wonderful, but that's not a bad outcome. And it might then be safer where governments are more willing to give money if the situation seems more stable yeah. than right now where they fear it may just be money down the drain. I mean, I'm, look, at one level, I am, uh, I may be very wary about military, U.S. military involvement, but I would strongly support greater financial assistance to the Ukrainian government, and I would, and I would strongly support giving financial assistance to the Ukrainian government now when it needs it, mm-hmm. uh, and not not in two or three years when all these reforms kicked in. I think reforms are important, but the key thing is to get the Ukrainian economy through the through the middle of next year in decent shape, uh, 
and, and, the, to keep and the government the, stable. That's what so I was it lasts and for to keep those the government stable. Years. So on this on this particular area, I'm pretty forward leaning. You know, I think we sh I think we can pony up significant sums of money, uh, and and so we, should Europe and and Europe even more, uh, and uh, particularly Germany. Germany's given what, a decent amount, but but Germany's capable for all of uh, their fiscal uh, the, for all of their economic problems, Germany's capable of, of really coming forward. East, other Eastern European countries really aren't. Now, the, the other thing, though, yeah. it, and this has nothing to do with Ukraine yeah. by itself, but there is traditionally a lot of resistance in yeah. the United States to sending foreign aid. Yeah. Do you, does anybody know what percentage of the federal budget is foreign aid? One, One percent. Yeah. Okay. No. Now, you can say every million counts, and there's a logic to that, yeah. but if you think, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't be spending a lot of money on dot, 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 yeah. we're not spending a lot of money on foreign yeah. aid, and, and probably collectively, we ought to do that, yeah. because it is a cheap way to make life better for yeah. some people and, and get things that we want. Right. It's a lot cheaper than using military force. It's right. a lot cheaper than invoking economic yeah. sanctions. But traditionally, and this is not brand new, this has been a made, and, and even if you tell Congress, look, people say that, but you know, they don't pay a lot of attention. Yeah. So you can you can do more. Yeah. I think a lot of people in Congress are afraid to to come out in favor yeah. of more foreign aid because they think it will cost them the election or at least make it harder to win yeah. the election. Yeah. And no. that's but that's been forever. It has nothing yeah. to do with Ukraine, nothing to do with post Cold War, nothing to do with post Iraq. That's been forever. Yeah. Whereas there is there is a sort of more openness to military force at times. Uh, you know, the, the point I would like to make, and this is, a, you know, now I'm giving my personal opinion. When we're dealing with this, this crisis in many ways, we need to remember what is the object? What is the goal? It's very easy to fetishize means in foreign policy. And we always have to remember what the end is. The end of the policy on the Ukraine is not to humiliate Putin. It is not to impoverish Russia. It is to give Ukraine as I said, a decent shot, right? And to me, the best way that Ukraine can get a decent shot is some, some deal that brings relative peace to the country, economic reform domestically, and increased foreign financial support that would have to include the United States and Germany as the chief contributors, frankly. One more. Anyone here has not asked a question? You have a good question. I have a really dumb question. Sorry. In, who started the trouble in Ukraine in the first place? Uh. <laughs> Can you use both sides of the piece of paper? <laughs> Can you give me a specific year you had in mind? And I'm not asking that facetiously. Well, I mean, the trouble started in Kiev, and but they were a response to something which was the response to something else. And the European Union uh, bears some responsibility for asking for conditions from Ukraine that were not very good. Well, you, you've had unstable governments and problem you, in you, problems in Ukraine since independence where you had factions fighting each other. So that's been nothing new there. Um, do you want to handle the EU part or do you want Joe to? I'm not. I'll, I'll give it to okay. Joe. <laughs> Well, look, you know, the problem with history is it's one damn thing after another. And, which is one of those quotes I've been using routinely for 25 years without knowing who said it. And when I finally looked it up, it, it's just, you know, I thought it was Henry Kissinger or Count Metternich, and it was Arnold Toynbee quoting somebody else. I mean, it's just, anyway. Uh, so it's really hard, it's really hard to pinpoint uh, because, of the, because of the shift back and forth in the Ukraine. Uh, you know, when did the decisive moment occur? Um, was, it, was it when the previous president reneged, uh, basically forwent the EU mm -hmm. agreement at first and then wanted to join the Russian? And then he backed out and went then to the he, Russians instead. He went back to the Russians instead. This was the proximate cause of the demonstrations, but only the proximate cause of the demonstrations. There were a lot of other issues at stake. 
Uh, the United States and, and the EU most definitely supported uh, the demonstrations. Uh, we did not organize a coup, no, but we did support, it was clear. We supported those demonstrations. So some of which were really a continuation of 2004. Right. Some of the same you know, issues. And, same and then uh, there was a very, there was a last minute deal that was struck that lasted less than 24 hours. And then the former president fled. Mm -hmm. Then there was a vote in the parliament that may or may not have been quite legal. Uh, so, in, as in much, and so it's very hard to 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 tease out the sort of perfect causal links here. What I'm trying to elicit from you is there is some blame on every side. <clears throat> yeah, but I'm very careful of that. Look. There is surely blame on all sides, but to say that there is blame on all sides is not to say that all sides were equally at blame. It depends on which side you are. <laughs> well, yes. Um, what do you think, Rick? I, I mean, each side will claim it was really the other's fault, but you know, as far as I know, there aren't American troops over there masquerading as volunteers. Yeah. Uh, and there are Russian troops doing that very thing. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, you know, there's something you have to be very careful about. Look. Yeah. There were neo-fascists that were in the Maidan. But that doesn't mean they dominate the current Ukrainian government. And guess what? There are neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian forces. All you need to do is look at some photos of the Azov battalion. But you know what? They don't dominate. Right, the Ukrainian forces. In other words, what you find, particularly in Russian propaganda, is taking a little kernel of truth, mm -hmm. right, and then blowing it up into a big deal. On the other hand, let's be honest, there are these elements, although they're very relatively small, there are these elements in both Ukrainian politics and in the Ukrainian military. So I think we can say yes, there's blame all around and still usefully weigh, weigh the blame. Weigh the blame. And there's nothing that the West or the EU has done that compares to annexing part of the Ukraine or, or supplying arms, weapons, and actual troops to a separatist movement. We've simply done nothing along those lines. And on that happy note. On that happy <laughs> note. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, but on the other hand, don't deny.